introduce myself just in case on Instagram because I think Facebook just went live. So hello everybody and welcome to the PT on Ice Daily Show. My name is Christina Previtt. I am one of two lead faculty for clinical management of the fitness athlete pregnancy and postpartum. We are an eight week online course where we deep dive into everything female athlete. We go from preconception through exercise modifications for pregnancy, labor delivery, early postpartum recovery, and then we go into all pelvic floor dysfunctions and how those may influence a woman as she tries to return to CrossFit or endurance style sports. We go into gymnastics, endurance, and barbell movements. Have you guys heard, we went through a major revamp for this upcoming cohort that starts next week, and that cohort is completely sold out. We are so pumped that it's sold out so far in advance. So if you didn't get your spot for our January cohort, our next cohort is starting March 8th, and the registration link for that is now up on ptinice.com. So if you want to jump in, we hope that you do, and um, we want to, to encourage you guys to sign up for our March cohort. We already have a couple people who signed up, so that's super, super exciting. We want to make the female athlete and pelvic health just part of our general conversation as PTs and not something that has to be necessarily a specialty. Okay, today I'm going to talk about a new study that actually came out at the beginning of December around incontinence and pelvic floor dysfunction in weightlifters and powerlifters. So this was a cross-sectional survey that was released by Carrie Bowes Lab. She has well, she is one, an absolute guru in the world of pelvic floor dysfunction in athletes. Honestly, I have a bit of a crush on her because she is doing all of the research studies that I want to be doing. These are the things that I want us to have research on. And so I'm so glad that she's a researcher in Europe somewhere. Um, and so she is doing incredible work around demystifying pelvic floor dysfunction in athletes. And one of the things that I always said was we really have no research. We have one study on female power lifters, but we have had literally nothing in weightlifters. And so I'm so excited to be able to share the results of this study with you. A couple of things that are fairly unique about this study compared to other cross-sectional surveys that are trying to explore relationships between athleticism and pelvic floor dysfunction. Number one is this study included men. We know obviously that being female is one of the biggest risk factors for pelvic floor issues, but that is not necessarily always the case. Men can have issues with, pelvic, with their pelvic floor as well and pressure mismanagement it tends to present in different ways than it does for women, but that doesn't mean that this is something that is just a conversation that I'll have with my female athletes and not with my male athletes. So that's number one. Number two is that women who had had children were actually quite a small representative piece of the overall picture when it came to some of these numbers around incontinence. And so I think that that's really interesting too, because this is saying that just like we know with other impact sports, we know that incidence of incontinence in female athletes in endurance and gymnastics, for example, is well over 50%. In trampoline athletes, it's like 80% of these women will experience incontinence in their sport. Um, we're starting to see some similar-ish trends when it comes to weightlifting. So what are some of the things that they evaluated? So they took a cross-sectional survey and they looked at which of these athletes are starting to experience incontinence. So how often does this happen? What type of pelvic floor dysfunction are they experiencing? And when is this occurring? Which the when question is something that I think we need to be evaluating more and more in the literature so that we as PTs can be exposing our athletes to these issues and seeing if we can 
coach first and use some of our PT strategies in order to be ameliorating these symptoms. So what they showed, I'm going to pull this study up so that I don't get any of the statistics wrong, is that I'm going to pull it up. Ah. So when it came to weightlifting activities, women who experienced incontinence, men who experienced incontinence, experienced incontinence with heavy lifting was 78%. So this is a one to five rep max. And this is fairly consistent with what we're seeing in the, the powerlifting literature, where it's usually, hi, how are you? Um, when we're, what we're usually seeing is that we are on the platform. So when you're experiencing one rep max, or when you're doing a heavy set of three or five. And so 78% of women, female powerlifters and Olympic weightlifters experienced stress urinary incontinence with a one to five rep max set. They also experienced, um, 56 and 63% experienced it with the squat and the deadlift, which is power lifting movements. Next most frequent was when you were weightlifting with a belt. That, this is another interesting thing we're gonna try and unpack. And then the less frequency around the clean and some explosive power training. So these are just looking at people who primarily do barbell work. So one of the interesting things is that what we, when we talk about pelvic floor dysfunction, we talk about the core canister and then we talk about the pelvic floor. We always say in orthopedics that your body needs to be strong enough to handle what you're asking it to do. And if it is not, it starts to break down. And traditionally, when we're conceptualizing this in orthopedics, that output is pain. We talk about all the time that pain is a signal. It is talking to us about where our thresholds lie. And when it comes to reconceptualizing this in the pelvic health space, our pain is essentially leaking. And so it makes sense, right, that we have this sometimes linear-ish, there are nuances to this, increase in interabdominal pressure, which is placing more pressure on the pelvic floor that it has to sustain. It has to maintain that tone around our sphincters in order for us to reduce incidence of leaking or prevent leaking of urine or stool when we don't want that to occur. And as we have this progressive increase in pressure, if it hits a critical threshold, then we're going to start to leak. And it makes sense that the higher the weight, the more likely we are to hit that critical threshold where we're experiencing symptoms. And if we think about overall inner abdominal pressure, what are the two movements that we're going to be experiencing the heaviest amount of load on our body? That is the squat and the deadlift. So it makes sense that we are going to be seeing this increase in incidence of leakage in pelvic floor dysfunction in these movements. Interesting, they also talked about weightlifting with a belt. So we see about a 10 to 15% increase in interabdominal pressure when weights stay constant when we are using a weightlifting belt. When we talk about returning to using a belt postpartum, it's this nuanced conversation around this pressure management system that we have to allow our, our female athletes to gradually re-expose themselves to and evaluate whether, whether their pelvic floor has enough strength in order to sustain that increase in pressure. So if we know that weight's staying constant, if a woman is not, say they're doing like a 60 kilo or 132 pound clean, and they are not incontinent without a belt, but become incontinent with a belt, it's that 10% discrepancy between the two loads that is where their pressure threshold is for leakage. And this is becoming a really interesting area of research where we're starting to look at things like vaginal peak pressures and interabdominal pressure and linking that to experience of symptoms subjectively and objectively with different me measures to be able to really unpack this to allow our female athletes to return to barbell-based movements. One of the other things that was a really, really important piece to this study was that they also talked about how this issue impacts performance. We, we know in the general population that stress and urge urinary incontinence have just overall massive, massive um, implications in terms of quality of life. When you are worried that you're, you can't enjoy yourself and laugh because you're gonna pee yourself and that's gonna be an embarrassing moment for you, that is something that when we translate this into the athletic realm, 
these can have really incur a lot of performance related anxieties and they can create a lot of issues. So one of them, 51% of women with incontinence issues said that they suffered from a lack of performance. Almost 60% said that there was a fear of visible leakage, fear of urine odor. They, 30% were embarrassed, over 30%. Um, a quarter of people said that they were frustrated or annoyed or worried that it was gonna happen. And almost one in three said that they had a negative, it had a negative effect on performance. So if you are picking up a heavy clean, I don't know if any of you who are listening who have gone for a one rep max clean and jerk, all you should be focusing on is the position that your body is in in order to make sure that you can lift the heaviest load possible. If you have experienced urinary incontinence, you may not be worried about your technique. You may be worried, oh my goodness, am I going to pee myself in the bottom of this clean? And that can just throw you off completely. It can make you have a lack of confidence with the lift, which if you've gone into Olympic weightlifting, you know that you need to approach that bar with confidence, especially if you're going for a one rep max. We need to make sure that we are, especially when you're getting closer to your max loads, that you are dialed in from a performance perspective because we, we know that there can be some increased risk of injury we don't want to be getting soft in the bottom of the clean because we're worried that we're going to pee ourselves or that we're focusing on doing that Kegel in the bottom instead of worried on keeping our elbows up, for example. And that could potentially lead to, to issues. So we don't have any um, literature on injury risk and incontinence, but we can see how potentially there are some factors there that if you are acting in the capacity of a coach, that you may not know what the heck is going on with your athlete because they are lifting in a completely different way when they hit certain percentages. And the reason why might be that they are focused more on not peeing than they are on what they are doing. And so there are really um, potentially profound um, issues with, with performance. And I have talked to some athletes who are like world-class, world-level. I did an interview with uh, Meg Scanlon and she was talking about how she was at our nationals and she was peeing all over the platform and it was making it almost impossible for her to complete her squat because that was all she was thinking about is that she's losing control of her bladder without wanting to lose control of her bladder when, um, when she was going for this national championship. So um, really, really important to be thinking about these types of things. Last thing I'm gonna talk about because it's never talked about and it's super prevalent is this study highlighted fecal incontinence. And fecal incontinence is the loss of flatulence, liquid or solid stool without meaning to. In the world of pelvic health, we talk a lot about loss of urine. We very rarely talk about loss of stool. It's one of the major factors in the geriatric space around um, loss of independence or transition to institutionalized care because the burden on the caregiver is absolutely massive. In weightlifting and powerlifting, this is usually meaning that people are letting one rip in the bottom of the squat. And if you have been a coach in a CrossFit gym or you have been a CrossFit athlete in the middle of heavy squat day, you know that this is true and this is common. And this is where both men and women showed a higher incidence. So I think the prevalence of anal incontinence was 80% in women where they felt like they had let air pass in the bottom of a squat or a clean. For men, I believe this was just over 50%. And so, yes, it was. Prevalence, yes, about 50%. So this is something that is happening to all barbell athletes. And so if we know that this is occurring, then we can start having proactive conversations around the pelvic floor. Um, we can start talking about how this is a pressure management system. And so if you're in the bottom of the squat and you're straining and instead of kind of holding inward pressure, you are pushing down, it is very easy for you to be leaking gas in the bottom of the clean or the squat. And so working through that, that canister and thinking about pressure as a gauge and breath as a way to manipulate that gauge 
is a very, very helpful way for you to be teaching your athletes, male and female, around pelvic health and particularly around pressure management when it comes to heavy lifting. So overall, this study was incredible. It is the, the entry point, so we need to be able to characterize what our problem is or what our issue may be before we can start doing uh, prospective or clinical trials that are looking at different ways to manage this. Um, as a pelvic health PT or an orthopedic PT working with lifters, these are issues that are happening that oftentimes many people feel very embarrassed to talk about. So being able to feel comfy having these conversations with your lifters is going to be very important because if you come in feeling really awkward talking about letting gas go at the bottom of your squat, um, you might have an athlete who feels really uncomfortable mentioning that it's something that they're embarrassed about as well. And so we now have some numbers and we can let that male athlete know that 50 to 60% of weightlifters may be experiencing that exact same thing and just not talking about it. Or they're gonna end up telling everyone about it because they're gonna hear it when they're in training. So things that, that we can have as tools in our toolbox and there are things that we can do about fecal incontinence as well that I think are important for us to be cognizant of because we talk a lot about urinary incontinence um, but the different types of fecal incontinence are sometimes left off the radar. Okay, I hope you all found that helpful. Um, if you have any questions about Carrie Bow's study, just let me know. This was really, really insightful. This was probably like, this was my Christmas present in December. And I hope you all um, can see how important it is for more and more of these studies to come out to start looking at some of our male colleagues and, and evaluating some of that um, incontinence and pelvic floor issues with them as well. And I hope that she continues this vein of research so that we can learn more and more about how to help our lifters that are experiencing pelvic floor dysfunction. All right, we talk about this study and more in our eight week online course. Oh man, Jeff and Alan are gonna be like, Christina, you talk so much, I'm already at 17 minutes. Um, so if you guys are interested in jumping in our next cohort, it is starting March 8th. We already have some people signed up, so very, very exciting. Um, if you guys have any questions about the course, you can let Alexis and I know. We would love to answer those for you. Otherwise, I will see you all on the podcast soon, or maybe in the course. I hope in the course. I hope both. Okay, bye. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.